So there have been a ton of videos circulating around called iceberg videos and this was actually recommended to me by one of my subscribers Quentin on Discord. I had no idea these types of videos existed until they started popping up on my recommended page and after watching some, I got hooked. Quentin saw that there was no NHL iceberg videos and sent me one that he created himself. And after I understood how these types of videos worked, I decided to create my own version basically adding in some things that I felt may have been left out. So here it is. A mix between Quentin and I's entries. Iceberg videos refer to the often used idiom, the tip of the iceberg, and these videos usually consist of unknown facts or theories, with the tip of the iceberg being the well-known facts, and the rest is pretty much self-explanatory. Essentially, the lower you go, the darker and more obscene the facts and theories get. Keep in mind, these theories are some of the most common ones thrown around, with a few exceptions. Also, similar to the Super Mario 64 edition of this video, I will be having a hockey stick in the bottom left of the screen. The fuller the stick, the more confidence I have in my explanations. A full stick means it's 100% a fact or can 100% be proven factual or confirmed. Also, for the sake of the video and so that YouTube does not get on my butt again, I'm going to be putting up a viewer's discretion is advised warning as we'll be talking about a few unsettling things. I assume this will be a long video, so I hope you all enjoy. With that all out of the way, let's get started. So, we all know this theory, as it's perhaps one of the most recent ones to circulate around. Basically, many believe that the draft was rigged so that the New York Rangers could select Alexi Lafreniere. Now, as much as I think this theory is kinda a joke, we need to look into it for the sake of the video. Going in, the Rangers had a 12.5 chance at getting the number one pick, and with such bad odds, it seemed really suspicious. Which caused fans to come up with three main theories slash claims. First, many claim that when the Rangers ball was placed inside the tube, it had a much heavier and harder sound than the others placed before it. It's also important to point out that to further back up that claim, the person who dropped the ball worked for Ernst & Young. Now, why is that significant, you ask? And finally, perhaps the most bizarre claim is that Bettman rigged it for New York as it's its hometown team. Well, there's a simple answer for that one. If that truly was the case, then the Rangers would have been getting first and second overall picks for decades on end. This theory seems outlandish, but is still pretty fun to look back on due to the possibility of it potentially being rigged. The chances of Atlanta ever getting another NHL franchise are pretty null and void, as they have had not one, but two chances to grow hockey in Atlanta and failed. In 1972, the Atlanta Flames would be founded and would play until 1980 before relocating to become the Calgary Flames. This was due to struggling to get fans into the stands as the team would only average around 10,000 people a night. It took a while to get another crack at the NHL, but in 1997, Atlanta was once again granted one more shot with the arrival of the Atlanta Thrash. They would step foot onto the ice in 1999, but would eventually fold in 2007, relocating to Winnipeg due to, once again, poor attendance. And this time, poor asset management. The team was so untalented that many weren't interested in watching them play, so even if Atlanta were to get a third shot at the NHL, history would most likely repeat itself once again. The Bill Peters incident is a tough one to talk about. As a Calgary Flames fan, it's a shame what happened to the players he coached. Basically, to summarize, former Rockford ice hog Akeem Alou came out accusing Bill Peters of using racial profanity directed towards him, specifically referring to the type of music he was listening to. Things got even worse for Peters when a former Hurricane came out and stated that Peters kicked him and punched an unnamed player in the face during a game. On November 27th, 2019, Peters would not coach the Flames as the organization organization would run an internal investigation. Two days later, he would resign and Jeff Ward would be named interim head coach. This incident is extremely well known for an unfortunately terrible reason. A personal story that I often remember was that a few days before the November 27th game, I attended the Flames Flyers game and was still very surprised to see Peters still on the bench. Although they spoke out years later, kudos to both Alou and the Hurricanes player for stepping up and doing the right thing. 
One of the craziest and bizarre moments in NHL history would occur during a game between the Bruins and Rangers in 1979 when Bruins Mike Milbury would jump into the stands beating a fan with their own shoe. This all started after a Rangers fan would cut Stan Johnson's face with a rolled up program and grab his stick. This would set teammate and infamous enforcer Terry O'Reilly off, causing him to climb over the plexiglass in an attempt to fight the fan. Peter McNabb would follow O'Reilly and eventually so would their teammates. Milbury on his way to the locker room, raced in to join the fun, causing this crazy moment to take place. After all the chaos ensued, O'Reilly would be suspended 8 games, and both McNabb and Milbury would be suspended for 6. The fiasco would also force the NHL to install taller glass panels, enclosing the rinks, making sure another moment like this never happens again. This is just a little fun fact I wanted to include that a lot of people, mostly newer fans, don't know about. But Mike Sillinger is actually the most traded player in NHL history, being traded to a record 9 teams throughout his NHL career. He would be traded to Anaheim in 1995, then Vancouver in 96, to Philly in 98, Tampa the same season, Florida in 2000, Ottawa in 2001, Nashville in 2004, and finally St. Louis in 2006. Even after being swapped 9 times, Times, Sillinger would still produce over 500 points in over a thousand NHL games, proving to be both a valuable player and an asset to any team he played for. Many people believe that Toronto, Montreal, Detroit, New York, Boston, and Chicago are the original six teams the league would start off with, but in reality, there were way more to exist beforehand. To this, I'll be referring back to my History of the NHL video to look back on every team that was around prior to the original six. One of the first teams to ever be in the league would be the Montreal Wanderers. They'd only play four games in the NHL before eventually withdrawing for reasons we'll talk about later, while the Quebec Bulldogs and Ottawa Senators were also around. But the Sens would leave the league, come back, and then relocate to become the St. Louis Eagles before folding in 1934. The Bulldogs didn't stick around either. They'd become the Hamilton Tigers and then would fold in the 1924-25 season. The New York Americans and Pittsburgh Pirates would join in 1925, but both teams would either relocate or fold. The Americans would become the Brooklyn Americans, folding in 1941, and the Pirates would later be known as the Philadelphia Quakers before folding in 1931. The Montreal Maroons would join in 1925 and would fold in 1938. So in conclusion, there were a lot more teams before the original six. Since YouTube wanted to age restrict my last attempt at covering this brutal injury, I'm gonna have to do my best to censor it out. But nearly every hockey fan remembers that extremely graphic jugular injury that Sabres goaltender Clint Malarchuk was sustained during a game between the Blues and Sabres. Basically, for those who didn't know, Blues Steve Tuttle and Sabres Yui Krupp would collide in front of the net, fighting for a loose puck. That was when Tuttle's skate blade would slice through Malarchuk's neck, tearing his carotid artery, and slicing his jugular vein. All of this took place on live television, and it's still extremely scarring for younger hockey fans, and even to some older fans as of today. Malarchuk would immediately be rushed to the hospital, thanks to former Navy combat medic Jim Pizzatelli's quick thinking, and would actually return to play 10 days after the incident occurred. In total, Malarchuk would lose 1.5 liters of blood, and would require 300 stitches. This is near the top of the iceberg, as although it's extremely scary to watch, nearly every hockey fan will forever have this etched in their minds. This theory has been going around for what seems like forever, and although it may seem silly, I do have to do my best to explain why this may be the case. And when looking for information to try and explain why this may be true, I actually found some pretty interesting information. Now, as a fan of a Canadian team myself, my only complaint was the fact that there was no video review in 2000. Okay. You've heard that excuse from Flames fans at least a thousand times, so I'll stop while I'm ahead. But one of the many reasons as to why fans think Bettman hates Canadian teams is that a Canadian team hasn't won a cup since 1993 which is ironically a controversial win in itself, due to a call which we'll talk about later. And a Canadian team hasn't made it to a final since 2011 when the Canucks made it and, well, lost. But besides the obvious, there's been some moves made during Bettman's tenure that have made fans believe he has a bias against Canada. First, when the NHL began to expand, not a single team would be added in Canada after the Ottawa Senators in 1992. Sure, the Thrashers moved to Winnipeg, but cities like Hamilton have been striving for a team for years, but have been overlooked by Seattle, Vegas, and perhaps Houston in the near future. Also, Quebec has been dying for a team ever since theirs was taken away from them as well. However, those are just some 
excuses. I was able to find an article that may have some actual proof that there's a strong bias against Canadian teams. Apparently, in an article I found in 2016, emails were leaked between Gary Bettman and an NHL executive that discussed conspiracies between the league and its officials to lower the odds of Canadian teams from reaching the postseason. Another email hinted at expanding the league, but only to American markets, which reverts right back to my previous claim in which I called an excuse. Since 2016, like mentioned, we've seen two new teams come into the NHL in US markets, Vegas and now Seattle, so perhaps these emails help support this theory. At face value, they seem extremely damaging, but I wish photo evidence was provided so I can show it on screen. But let me know your thoughts. Do you think Bettman actually hates Canadian teams? When teams hoist a cup, the excitement is through the roof. Not only will you forever go down as a Stanley Cup champion, but your name will be etched on the cup forever. But there's a fun fact really anyone knows about the Stanley Cup that even caught me by surprise. Although there are names on the cup, there are actually names inside the cup as well. Granted, there aren't a lot of them, but in total, over 30 names are written inside the cup. 20 of them come from the 1906-07 champions Montreal Wanderers, who are obviously no longer around. Nine more more came from a team called the Vancouver Millionaires, who were one of the only few teams to win the cup despite never actually being in the NHL. The only reason this was possible was because back in 1914, the NHL wasn't the sole possessor of the cup, meaning any team from any league could try and challenge for the Stanley Cup. One of those teams ended up being the Millionaires. They'd win in 1914 before the NHL even existed. The last name is not only inside the cup, but is also upside down. Harry Punch Broadbent's impact on both the NHL and NHL was so grand that his name stands alone inside the cup. He was one of the NHL's first power forwards and would be elected into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1962. Taro Tujimoto's story is both humorous and flat out absurd. To make things clear, Taro Tujimoto isn't actually a real person. He's 100% made up, but he was also drafted by the Buffalo Sabres 183rd overall in the 1974 NHL Draft. At the time, the NHL Draft was a long, slow, and boring process. It would occur via telephone as the league wanted to make sure that its rivals, the WHA, didn't know who they were selecting. Then Sabres GM Punch Imlac became fed up with the boring process and wanted to have some fun. He would do so at Clarence Campbell's expense, making up a player on the spot, drafting him into the NHL. Imlock told PR director Paul Whelan to make up a fictional player, and right away, he wanted to make him of Asian descent. Whelan remembered passing by the Tujimoto store as a college student, and he would call the store owner, asking if it was okay to use their family name. He, of course, happily agreed, and thus, Taro Tujimoto was created. Once the league caught wind of this, Tujimoto would be later listed as an invalid claim after his name would end up on the training camp roster, further exciting some fans. It's believed by many that Jacques Plante was the first goaltender to have ever worn a mask, but it goes a little deeper, as the first person to ever wear face protection was a woman. In 1927, Elizabeth Graham would be the first to ever sport a mask. Her reasoning for doing so was to protect her teeth after getting dental care. Fast forward to 1930, and Clyde Benedict would become the second to don a mask, protecting his nose from injury. And finally, in the 1936 Olympics, Teji Hanma would wear a crude mask, similar looking to a baseball mask worn by a catcher. It was made of leather and had a wired cage that protected both his face and his glasses. Although this is a sad story for Nordiques fans, it's still a cool topic to look back on, as before moving to Colorado, the Nordiques had plans to change up their entire look. For those who don't know the story, in 1995, it was announced that the Quebec Nordiques would be relocating to Denver, and this was due to struggling to pay player salaries as the Canadian dollar got weaker, and the fact that they played in a small market. Photos were released in the newspaper, showing that the logo would be changed from the classic igloo holding a stick to a husky. The Iron Nordiques would be an icicle, and the color palette will be changed from red, white, and blue to teal, black, and navy. Unfortunately, they would miss a deadline, and the new designs wouldn't have gone into effect until the 96-97 season. And by then, the team was already in Colorado and were Stanley Cup champions. The Montreal Wanderers were one of the four original teams to enter the NHL, 
and ironically, they would only play in a total of four NHL games. This was during the NHL's debut season, so losing a team so early was disheartening. But the way they left is even more gut-wrenching. On January 2nd, 1918, the Wanderers' home rink, the Montreal Arena, would burn to the ground. This would occur after the team would lose two star players in Sprague and Odie Cleghorn, and went 1-3 in, in four games. Before the incident, they would actually acquire goaltender Hap Holmes from Seattle and the PCHA, and things looked like they'd be going up. But after the fire, the Wanderers would apply for player help two times, being denied both times. The team would default its next two games, and then would disband from the NHL. Hap Holmes would never get a chance to play in a Wanderers uniform, making it one of the league's first ever what-ifs someone could look back on. When Vegas came into the league, they got lucky right off the bat, as they would get some pretty great upgrades to their expansion draft rules. Before, teams were allowed to protect one goaltender, nine forwards, and five defensemen, making it harder for the new expansion teams to acquire talent. But now, teams were allowed to protect either seven forwards, three defensemen, and one goalie, or eight skaters, and one goaltender. This allowed a much deeper pool of players for Vegas to choose from. Vegas was also able to trade with other teams, taking concessions so they wouldn't pick certain players from other teams, and these trades would actually end up helping the Golden Knights. Trades that would include sending Riley Smith to Vegas so they'd select Marchessault, sending Theodore so they'd take Stoner, and sending Alex Tuck over so they would select Eric Howla. This seemed extremely fishy. Why change the rules? Why give Vegas these unique advantages? Well, some like to think they did this as one of their recent expansion teams didn't do as well. The Thrashers had to relocate to Winnipeg due to both lack of fans and talent so perhaps the league wanted to make Vegas more competitive so they'd avoid a possible relocation or disbanding in the future. At the time of the 2005 draft, one team in particular seemed desperate for the number one overall pick. The Pittsburgh Penguins, who lacked little to no talent at the time, actually being labeled equivalent to an AHL team by one GM, were in troubled waters. The team looked on the verge of financial collapse, and there were rumors about relocating to Kansas City. The player who highlighted the 05 draft was a guy named Sidney Crosby. Crosby was expected to be a franchise-changing talent, and was a child prodigy growing up. Teams were dying to get a shot at taking him. Just one problem. There was no NHL season that year, so the draft order would be determined by a weighed draft. Teams were weighed based off playoff appearances in the last three seasons and first overall picks in the last four drafts. The only teams with three balls who had the highest chances of getting Crosby were the Sabres, Rangers, Blue Jackets, and Penguins. Well, many believed that the league was able to fix the lottery to help Pittsburgh land their next big superstar, to eventually help turn the team around. And conveniently enough, one once they drafted Crosby, they were able to get a deal for a new arena, staying in Pittsburgh, and going on to win three Stanley Cups. Now, although it would have made more sense for the league to rig it for the Rangers as they were a big market team, it's very well possible that Bettman helped Lemieux save the Penguins by helping them land Crosby. And maybe, just maybe, and this could be a stretch, but perhaps the Rangers would win Lafreniere years later as a compensation for not landing Crosby in the 05 draft. Going into the topics of theories, here's another one. For this, we have to go back to 1993 for the Marty McSorley illegal stick incident, as some theorists like to believe that McSorley's stick was previously placed inside the locker room before puck drop, meaning a member of the Montreal staff purposely put an illegal stick in the room, saving it for a key moment in the game. And it could very well be true, as how could you vividly see an illegal stick from the coach's perspective on the bench? Guy Carboneau was the one who spotted the stick and told Demers to measure so it could make sense as to why a player could spot an illegal stick, but McStorley believes things were fishy, and he's the reason this theory exists, as he believes that a member of the Montreal staff had access to the King's stick rack and that he wasn't the only player to have had an illegal curve on his stick that night. If that's truly the case, then that's insane. But we have to remember that back then, stick measurements were a common tactic used by desperate teams to try and start a comeback. So perhaps, like Demers himself mentions, he did have an eye for illegal sticks, and that it was actually legit. Or maybe McSorley is right, but he used illegal sticks all the time, so as much as this story is fun to tell, I think I'll stick with the mirrors on this one. Closer to home, the NHL Executive Committee meets tomorrow in New York to discuss the Islanders' sale to John Spano.
as well as possible NHL expansion. John Spano was supposed to be the savior of Islanders hockey. He was going to come in, be active in the free agent market, and promise to keep the team in Long Island. This was because, at the time, the Islanders were at rock bottom, and rumors about relocating to Nashville, Atlanta, and Houston were heating up by the day. There was some hope when Spano was brought in. He claimed he was worth $22.3 billion, and that he inherited wealth from his grandfather. This meant he could manage money extremely well, and would perhaps upgrade the arena and the roster and turn things around. Just one problem, John Spano was a swindler. Things started to become fishy when he failed to pay the first $16.5 million payment on the cable rights on April 7th, but he was able to pump in $2.5 million into the team's payroll, which made no sense. He also told Milbury to pack his bags, making him give his head coaching job to Rick Bonas. When the NHL Board of Governors met in June, Spano wouldn't be present, and that that was when things went south. As the league soon realized, Spano fooled them all. Newsday would release a story that June exposing Spano for the crook that he really was, stating his net worth was only $5 million and that neither of his grandparents had an estate valued more than $246,000. Spano was forced to give up control of the Islanders and give it to Pickett. More companies came out and sued Spano for fraud, and after attempting to free to the Cayman Islands, he would plead guilty to the charges and admitted he planned to defraud the Islanders and to forging numerous documents. The Islanders were a mess during the 90s, and the Spano incident makes things a bit more embarrassing. On September 29th, 2003, Thrasher's forward Danny Heatley would be seriously injured after losing control of his Ferrari, crashing into a wall, splitting the car in half, and launching both him and his passenger out of the vehicle. Heatley managed to survive the crash, obviously, but unfortunately, his passenger was none other than teammate Dan Schneider, whose injuries were so fatal that he couldn't get the same result. Heatley would suffer from a broken jaw and a minor concussion, but Schneider would fracture his skull and would die in the hospital of sepsis on October 5th. This news shocked the hockey world, and fans were mourning the loss of Schneider. Heatley would plead guilty to second degree vehicular homicide and would admit to consuming alcohol prior to the accident. He would be sentenced to three years of probation and would avoid having to go on trial. This was because of a plea deal that dropped the first degree vehicular homicide charge. Despite the loss of Schneider, the Thrashers were very supportive of Heatley. Schneider's family even told the prosecutors that nothing would be gained if Heatley was locked up. This crash forever stains Heatley's career, and some speculate it was one of the reasons as to why he'd request a trade out of Atlanta. Just a strange coincidence that I thought should be pointed out, but during Brad Marchand's 666th game, things got a little weird. To start, he'd be facing none other than the New Jersey Devils, which made fans crack up as Twitter was going nuts, but he would also be coming into that night's matchup with a career total of 666 penalty minutes. Brad Marchand is regarded as one of the league's most annoyingest pests, so a stat line like that headed into his 666th game was extremely fitting. But it doesn't just end here, as the final score of that game ended up only being 1-0, and the only goal would be scored by none other than Brad Marchand. On the topic of extremely weird coincidences, Pat Quinn night will go down as one of the most infamous as fans believed Pat Quinn was with them that night. Quinn wore number 23 as his time as a Leaf, and believe it or not, would sadly pass away on the 23rd of November. So when the Leafs faced off against the Capitals on the night where they'd honor Pat Quinn's legacy, the number 23 would appear everywhere. To start, it would be the 23rd game of the season for the Leafs, and head coach Randy Carlisle wore number 23 when he was a member of the Maple Leaves, starting off the night on an already ironic note. But all throughout the night, number 23 continued to appear. With 23 seconds left in the first, the Leafs would score, making it 2 0. And then 23 seconds into the second, the Leafs would score again, making it 3 0. Washington would respond back, but so would the Leafs. 23 seconds after the Capitals would make it a 3 1 game. The Leafs would finish the night with a total of 23 shots on goal and would win the game, honoring Pat Quinn in the strangest way possible. 
This story wasn't one that I was able to find. In fact, you probably won't even see anything about this online. This story comes directly from Quentin, so we'll read it from his perspective. He sent me something to read out loud, so I'll be reading based off of what he sent me. He starts off by going, quote, A little while back, maybe 7-8 years ago, I remember reading a story somewhere about a lost Penguins jersey that looked particularly like the 2011 Winter Classic jersey as pictured below. I remember reading that this jersey was intended intended to be the team's first jersey, but, but was replaced with the actual original jersey because then Penguins owner, Jack McGregor, didn't like the design. From what I remember, years later, looters were roaming through dumpsters around the igloo and found a garbage bag that contained the two original jerseys, in such poor condition, however, that they couldn't be restored. So they were simply scrapped. Thing is, though, is that I couldn't find this story anywhere. I did some digging online and could find no info, and even asked members of the THG Discord Discord and the Discord for r slash penguins and couldn't find any info there either. I swear I read this story in a jersey themed issue of the Hockey News, but couldn't find the story in my copy of the issue. I also want to make it clear that I'm not referring to the 68-69 uniforms, which are the ones that the 2008 Winter Classic jerseys were based off of. This jersey looked like the 2011 Winter Classic jersey. Maybe it was a made up story that was going around at the time of the jersey's release, since it really doesn't look like anything the team has ever worn. I can see See it being fake, but I don't know how I would vividly remember the story the way I do. It's certainly strange. If any one of you guys in the comments wants to help Quentin and I out on this one, it would be extremely appreciated. This story sounds super intriguing and I want to know more. And honestly, I hope these are real and they can be found. On September 27th, 2015, Maple Leafs prospect Victor Louvre commented about drug abuse in professional hockey and his response was one the league didn't want to hear. Louvre would state to the public, quote, in the NHL, there is a lot of cocaine, and there's bound to be some in the AHL as well. Louvre did vouch for his teammates, stating he hasn't seen any of his Marley's teammates take part in such actions. Louvre's statement was a surprise to some, to those who actually remember it, that is. As you can't find any visual evidence of the interview anywhere. Some, including myself, believe the league has been trying to push this under the rug, hiding any suspicion that there may be drug problems in the NHL. When asked to confirm his accusation, Louvre still insisted that it is a problem and that, quote, they probably don't want to talk about it. This leads into a conversation that appears in the next layer of the iceberg. Perhaps Louvre may actually be correct. Some fans speculate that there is in fact serious doping issues in the NHL. Going off of what Louvre said and the research that I was able to accumulate, the NHL might not be as clean as we thought. In a CBC article from 2011, former Habs tough guy George Larac publicly stated that he knew a lot of players who used performance enhancement drugs to better their performance, and surprisingly, he stated that the star players were mostly the ones taking them. He also mentioned that enforcers would take PEDs as well to gain more weight becoming harder to take down. Lorac stated that as a former enforcer, if you saw a guy's eyes bulging, and arms trembling, you knew he wouldn't feel any punch being thrown at him. We've previously seen other instances besides PEDs. In fact, going back to Victor Louvre, it's been rumored that cocaine has been running rapid in the league as well. We all remember Evgeny Kuznetsov's leaked video of him with some nose candy and Yuri Laterra being linked to a Finnish cocaine ring, but the NHL claims they've tried their hardest to crack down on the issues by strict drug testing. But when looking at the list of players who've actually been suspended due to drug usage, it's been anything but straight. In fact, the current drug testing program doesn't test for marijuana or cocaine or any other recreational drug for that matter, mainly performance enhancement drugs and other enhancers. So maybe Lou was right and that perhaps there are cocaine and other drug problems in the NHL. This will be the last time we talk about performance enhancers and whatnot, as this is also a theory as well. One that could be true, but is just pure speculation. On September 2nd of 2018, it was announced that Golden Knights defenseman Nate Schmidt would be suspended 20 games for the use of PEDs. Schmidt would be openly upset about the suspension, stating he was extremely disappointed at receiving one. But about a month after Schmidt was suspended, fellow teammate Valentin Zykov would also be suspended 20 games for the same 
same exact reason, making fans begin to believe that something was up with the Golden Knights. Psykov's agent said it was a protein supplement that may have caused a positive test, but that seems far-fetched. To have two Knights players be suspended for performance enhancement drugs within a span of a month made people believe that the great success of the Knights was potentially stained by PED abuse. Now, mind you, this was already after I mentioned that their success may have been handed to them by a rigged expansion draft, so it's most likely impossible that both instances could happen all in one season. But if I could believe one of them, I would probably say the Knights using PEDs seems like a more logical theory. The stats don't lie either, as some of the Knights' brightest stars such as William Carlson dropped significantly in totals. But Knights fans, this wasn't an attempt to take a jab at you, and I promise that we're done talking about y'all for the rest of the video. Try not to hate us too much. Terrible Ted Green was known as a feisty, hard-hitting defenseman who was widely respected amongst teammates and coaches. But when talking about Green, you sadly can't do so without bringing up perhaps the most brutal hockey injury in history he would endure during a preseason game in 1969. Green and St. Louis Blues' Wayne Mackey would engage in a bloody and horrendous stick-swinging fight that would fracture Green's skull, sending skull pieces into his brain. Both Green and Mackey were charged with assault, and Green would spend hours under operation in an attempt to save his life. Green would return with a metal plate in his head in 1971, and Wayne Mackey would be sent down to the AHL, eventually being taken in the 1970 expansion draft by the Vancouver Canucks. All live footage of the incident has since been destroyed via the league's request, as they feared it would be too graphic for fans to watch, and rightfully so. But this incident is now considered lost media, and a moment that will forever go down in infamy as one of the dirtiest exchanges in NHL history history. The legend, or should I say the curse of Bill Barocco, is both an interesting yet chilling story to tell. Barocco wasn't your typical NHL player of the 50s, in fact, he could barely skate, but the impact he left on the city of Toronto was a huge one. The 1951 Stanley Cup final between the Habs and Leafs would go into overtime, and Bill Barocco was able to completely shut down Richard, Lack, and the rest of Montreal's stars. Barocco was already a champion prior to his moment, but he was merely a plug-in player who still made managed to be a fan favorite. Barocco would take a chance in overtime, abandoning his blue line, taking a shot on net, and he would deliver. McNeil cleared off to the side, he passed right out to Barocco, he's on the left wing, he shoots, he scores! Barocco would score the dagger, giving his team the Stanley Cup. Bash and Bill became the talk of the town, but once the fun was over, Barocco went back home to visit his family, and this was when things took a turn for the worse. A family friend offered to take him on a fishing trip, flying to Quebec for a few days, and Bill eagerly accepted even after his mother begged him not to go. Barocco would leave on August 26th, and was never seen again. Rumors fed like wildfire when fans realized he wasn't coming back. Many believed he defected to Russia, while others thought he ran away after committing a crime. Nonetheless, the Leafs felt the loss of Bash and Bill, as the franchise would win a Stanley Cup for the next decade. That is, until 1962, when, strangely enough, Barocco's remains would be found lying in a swamp under the debris of a plane. It was a little while after Barocco was found that the Leafs would once again win the Stanley Cup, making fans believe that they've been cursed. Barocco's disappearance is still one of the most chilling stories in NHL history, but there's another layer on this iceberg for a reason. We've talked about this in a previous video, but for those who are new, the name Operation Slapshot was a code name given to the undercover investigation to take down an illegal gambling ring involving numerous NHL coaches, staff members, and even players. The ring started in 2001 and lasted until 2006 when it was finally brought down. Thousands of wagers were tied to the ring as they would bet on football, basketball, and even collegiate sports. The news came out at an extremely bad time as the NHL was was in the middle of a lockout. The people involved in the ring would include Rick Tockett, Travis Green, Jeremy Roenick, James Harney, Janet Jones, and none other than Wayne Gretzky. This type of investigation could seriously damage the league's reputation, especially if the Great One was actually involved. And it turns out that the ring was allegedly tied to a crime family in Philadelphia and New Jersey. Luckily, they didn't bet on NHL games. If so, it would have been extremely damaging. But arrests were made. 
James Harney would be arrested for six years for money laundering and conspiracy, while Rick Tockett pleaded guilty, getting two years of probation. Apparently, when under operation, Tockett handled the money while Harney handled the wagers. Janet Jones, wife of Gretzky, stated she never bet on games for Wayne and that both she and Tockett would lose multiple business opportunities due to the scandal. The NHL was low-key trying to hide Operation Slapshot from being aired to the public. After doing more research on the topic, I can strongly say I know more about the case now than what I did before. Now, however, when you look up Operation Slapshot, thanks to both myself and Odd Man Rush, results and articles will now pop up as opposed to before, when all that would appear would be photos and videos of the Capitals mascot, Slapshot. Another topic we previously discussed, Mike Danton's attempt to hire a hitman mid-game is still one of the most bizarre occurrences in NHL history. Two days after the Blues were eliminated by the Sharks in the 2004 Stanley Cup playoffs, Mike Danton would be arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Danton was said to have been trying to hire a hitman to kill his agent David Frost, but in a 2011 interview, Danton states it was his father he was trying to get rid of. The relationship between Frost and Danton is a crazy one and definitely isn't normal. A CBC documentary would be released showcasing the controlling relationship Frost and Danton had. Frost encouraged Danton to separate himself from his parents and even allegedly abused Danton's younger brother. Leaked phone calls, which I was actually able to obtain, show that Frost demanded Danton plead guilty, forcing him to end the call saying, I love you. Remember something, okay? Yeah. This isn't gonna last long. We're gonna, we're gonna do what we said we're gonna do. We're gonna get you into the counseling and that changes everything. Tomorrow, hopefully you're sent um, to St. Louis by Thursday because the, they're subpoenaing me into court for Thursday, 9.30. So I have to testify before the grand jury. Just be calm, don't talk quickly, talk quietly, or talk calmly. You know, if, 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 you, know what might, you might have a breakdown. If you do, that's fine. You know, I'm not telling you to do it. I gotta go. Okay. All right. Listen, yeah. I am behind you. I know. We all are. Okay. I love you, kid. Love you, too. This call could back up the claims that Danton and Frost may have had a relationship at one point in time. To this day, Frost still believes he wasn't Danton's main target, but fans believe he's naive because he was so controlling of Danton. This story is still so bizarre, and so is the last one in this video, just sadly for a more depressing reason. Brittany Cecil was a young, vigorous hockey fan attending the matchup between the Columbus Blue Jackets and Calgary Flames. She'd get the tickets as a present from her dad, and she was ecstatic. However, little did anyone know that this would be the last game she'd ever see. In the third period, a Knudsen shot would be deflected by Derek Morris and out into the stands. And, well, that puck would hit Brittany in her left temple of her forehead, fracturing her skull. She would be taken to the hospital while the play was continuing. On her way, she would suffer a seizure and would be admitted. Things seemed like they were going smoothly hours later until a CT scan revealed a torn artery that was unknowingly causing clotting and swelling. Unfortunately, less than 48 hours after being hit by the deflected shot, Brittany Cecil would be announced dead just two days before her 14th birthday. Both Morris and Knudsen would show remorse and guilt after the freak accident, and Kutznutsen would even meet with Cecil's family afterwards. The impact of this injury made the NHL step in, making it mandatory that all arenas have safety netting above the glass on both sides of the rink. Brittany Cecil's death is a sad tale to tell. May she forever rest in peace. If you made it to the end of the video, let me know your thoughts. I hope I was able to correctly create an iceberg video, and I hope you all enjoyed. Thanks for the massive support and for stopping by. If there's anything we missed or you want to include, feel free to comment your thoughts below. Thanks to Quentin for the idea, and I hope it was worth your time. The NHL has had some crazy things happen throughout its 100 plus years, and there's bound to be more things included as time moves on. And as we've seen in today's video, there may be even more beneath the surface than we may even know. 